Anfa interviews Mark McCurry. Hey, it's Anfa, and today I have a very special guest, Mark McCurry, who is the main maintainer and developer of Zenit SubFX. And he's with me today. I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions. So let's just kick it off. Hi, Mark. Excellent. <laughs> let's begin then. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm Mark McCurry. I uh, maintain Zenad sub effects. And yeah, I look forward to this interview, I guess. <laughs> so maybe for those who don't know you, who you are, could you tell us what do you do? Like, where do you come from? I don't know. Where do you live? What do you do for a living? So uh, for basically my whole life, I've been on the US East Coast, uh, depending upon what year it is. I've either been in the Northeast or down South. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've been at uh, grad school. I recently finished up a PhD in electrical engineering. So I've got a pretty big background in terms of understanding the sort of complex math that happens in programs like Zenad SubFX. And professionally, I've taken those skills and I do a lot of machine learning and uh, signal processing. Uh, so in the past, I've worked on uh, at one place that did audio conferencing, Polycom. And currently, I'm working at another organization, which is doing some biometrics work. So what that means is uh, if you have pictures of someone's face, you can do face recognition. If you have literal fingerprints, then you can do fingerprinting on those and be able to identify individuals that way. And there's just a lot of math in being able to take in all these different images of things and then figure out how to tell a computer how to interpret things. So I'm the one that does that sort of translation. Machine learning and signal processing. It's funny because it looks like what you're doing for a living is quite neatly meshing with what you're doing after hours, I guess, as a, for Linux audio community as a developer. Yeah, it's, it was something that kind of uh, meshed pretty well because I originally got into uh, Zenit SubFX because, well, I, at the start, I kind of got a little ahead of my coursework and was interested in some of the subjects. So why not try it out on real software first? <laughs> oh, so I guess that's nicely uh, can lead us to, well, how did you get started? Maybe let's start with, how did you get started with Linux at all? Because I guess you're using Linux. What You can tell us what you're running. And how did you come to run Linux? So that first happened, oh boy, quite a few years back. Would have probably been around the time of uh, middle school or high school in the US. Uh, and essentially, I found computers to be an interesting sort of thing that I didn't really understand. So I kind of wanted to figure them out. I'd gone through and understood a lot of other like more mechanical or sort of physical devices. And it was just, well, how does this complex machine actually work? And Linux was a decent way to get access to development tools to be able to experiment around. I think probably my first experience uh, was uh, downloading a live CD of Nopix. And I don't know if they're still kicking around. If they are, well, even if they are not, like it was a fantastic hmm. live CD with an absolutely humongous amount of software. It was just like staggering at that time when you're going from having probably a Windows 98 box or something that's maybe a little bit more recent than that, probably XP at that time. And then just being able to put in this DVD and just have all the software just loaded up there, no cost, just the hassle of mm -hmm. trying to figure out how do you download this ISO over the internet with a really slow connection. <laughs> I guess it, and it, it would have been huge. Oh, man. Well, it, it was a DVD image. It wasn't even a CD image. So like that, that was fun. And from there, I ended up uh, working with a project called Slacks for a while. Uh, they were another live CD distribution. And a lot of the infrastructure that they put out in terms of uh, being able to hot load modules uh, in the context of live CDs are just kind of file system overlaying extra packages. 
they, they built up a lot of that infrastructure. And at the time I ended up maintaining some packages and probably answering a lot of beginner questions incorrectly on the forms. <laughs> oh no. So yeah, well, you the newbies. <laughs> screwing up the newbies, rolling yeah. over. <laughs> no so, problem. Learned a lot from there. And then around that same time, I had one desktop that just the Windows install was completely dead. So I couldn't mess up the computer any worse than it was. So I, I Why not wipe it and put Linux there, right? <laughs> yep. I, let's see, I did some Ubuntu. Maybe I tried out Red Hat. I tried Gen 2. I think I tried it for like four days, at which point I had nothing properly compiled. And I gave up on that, never uh, going back. Uh. Then I think I, from there, I just moved into Slackware as soon as I had an Ubuntu installed that I tried to upgrade once. Because as, as some broke. people might know. <laughs> uh, did you do yeah. dist, dist upgrade? Like the the massive distribution upgrade to a new release? Was it, it, that? it was for a new release. Yeah. And <laughs> you might know. <laughs> oh. It doesn't survive new oh, releases. No. Oh no! Not reliably. Ubuntu at least. wasn't good with that. I hated this. Uh, it, yeah, it, it was I, I just, think I just you got had, so frustrated. Yeah, you, I just installed Slackware. It, it was a bit like you, you had to do a fresh install every half a year if you wanted to be running new stuff, <laughs> which is weird. And I'm surprised that Mint doesn't do this. As far I'm using Mint for like a year, maybe a year and a half, and it doesn't break itself at least. So it's it's nice. Yeah, yeah so carry on. This this physical machine has a relatively recent uh, Slackware install. It used to run Arch for a little while until System D completely broke everything. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. But my desktop uh, that has been running a Slackware install since I think I still have files on there from two thousand eight. Oh man, that was when I released my first album that is no longer available. <laughs> That's like ancient times of, of my... I, I also, it was the time that I started running Linux at all. First Ubuntu, I went... Oh yeah, oh man, 8.4 something. Whew. Yeah, so that, that computer has uh, gone through several hardware upgrades. But every time a new Slackware release comes out, I just update, and it has worked fine. It's still running since 2008. It's yeah. a decade. <laughs> Almost. I mean, there, there were some hard drives that I took out of it, which <laughs> which were like, oh, I think early 2000s at one point or another. At some point, I've got to upgrade the main hard drive because it is a very, very slow disk drive. Not a lot of hard disk space either. But maybe it's reliable. Maybe it survived without crashing the, the heads into the platters or something. Um, let me think. How many moves has that thing gone through? So that would be 8, 9, 10. It's been through like 12 moves. Oh my. You're shaking stuff a lot when you're moving things and, you know, poking, poking, putting on a truck, unboxing it again. That's weird that it survived so long. I mean... Well, the motherboard on that has died, I think, once. I Let's see. The power supply, that died once. I've replaced the hard drive once or twice. I think it still has its original floppy drive. Some of the USB <laughs> ports in the front no longer fully work. So it, it, it's slowly falling to pieces, but it's still alive. And Linux is keeping it rolling. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh man, that's quite a lot of stuff and wow, I had a, a few hard disk crashes. One hard disk crash was when uh, a big hard drive from my PC just started dying and my friend helped me and copied it over to his drive. And literally after we finished that, one chip just burst into flames and <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, we're, we're, we did it in time. <laughs> But I wasn't running I mean, with, Linux back then. With standard hard drives, I feel like if you're listening to the device and just paying attention to any sort of weird stops, you, you can kind of see some of them coming. It's, it's weird because I have a drive that has like 12 months 
no, 13 months in my laptop. I replaced it and it's it's got read errors and I had kernel, kernel panic. Just can't load root file system. And I'm sending it out, which is weird. Why? I didn't throw it away. I just I took it on a plane and gone to Sonoy and back and that's it. <laughs> like not no stuff. No no hard stuff. Yeah, stuff like that is whenever you're doing important work, you always back it up, back it up, back it up. Yeah, I, I just you know, every three days I just run a copy with our disk our div backup and my my PC can burn. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I can save up for you for a new one, but I can recover the data. All right. Yeah. Um, I think when I was working on my uh, dissertation, I had that in four places at any given moment. I had like one copy on my desktop, one on my laptop, one on a physical hard drive near me, one uploaded to the server that I got sitting. I uh, rented with Linode. So yeah. <laughs> That's like industry. Something you got to be paranoid about. <laughs> That's like industrial level redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you like to to s tell us uh, how did you get started with audio at all? Because we know how you started with Linux, but how did you go get into sound? So essentially, oh goodness, it would it would have probably been like early to mid elementary school. I had piano lessons. So learned how to play the piano at that age. And at some point, any kid that has an instrument gets sick and tired of practicing the instrument. And so there was a period of time where I didn't really play it all that much, but I would occasionally do stuff. And then when I uh, started going to college, I kind of wanted to be able to play piano a little bit, but I didn't realize that my campus had any pianos. So I started playing around with any sort of audio program I could find. And... I think it was like within a week or two of being at my college, I ended up going into town, found a music store, bought a relatively large uh, MIDI keyboard and hooked it up and was trying to play around with it. And at that point, I looked around and saw what sort of software stuff there was because the built-in like organ that it had sounds bad, pretty bad. <laughs> so, And it had just one <laughs> patch, right? Oh, no, it, it's got a couple of them, but I, I don't think I've come across any sort of physical keyboard that if it's not a synthy sort of sound that comes out of it, they all just don't sound right. The, I think the worst one I saw was there was one in a practice room at my college, and it was oh, supposed no. to sound like a piano, but it had a hideous amount of reverb that they had added onto the piano samples like hard printed into the samples yes <laughs> and you were in a in an acoustically like dampened room <laughs> and you're like there's not going to be any sort of reverb here whatsoever and then this thing just is going off and off and off and was it like you you pressed the chord and it sounded like a piano in a reverb chamber and then you released it and it just got mute immediately or what no, no, it, it would just keep it, going, but it, would, <laughs> it didn't match the physical room that you were in, so it was just mentally off-putting. <laughs> That's something I sometimes do to, to make myself more inspired to sing. I just put on headphones, I turn on reverb, and I sing, and I listen to my voice, but I just forget where I am, and I just put myself in a different space to get inspired. But that wasn't working there, I guess. <laughs> yes, I... <laughs> With some practice, I'm sure I could have gotten used to it, but at that point, I was mostly used to physical pianos. Maybe there should be a, a message, close your eyes above this keyboard. <laughs> I mean, that works sometimes, but when you're trying to read the sheet music, that can be difficult. <laughs> and when you don't know the piano keys by heart, well, oh man. Well, my, my problem with piano is I, I learned how to sight read, so until... I was actually working with uh, musical notation programs after I had been introduced to Zen. Uh, up until that point, I didn't know the names for any of the keys. I just knew, okay, that note there means I press this thing there. So you just mapped the visual keyboard on a screen to a keyboard on your desk, right? Yep. Hey, right, so you didn't, <laughs> you didn't know what, and, and what was what? And that pretty normal. You got the two schools of thought, either the jazz or the classical styles of teaching. And how do they differ? So the classical, 
someone in the comments may very well correct me on this, but it's uh, my knowledge that classical focuses a lot more on sight reading, being able to play pieces, whereas jazz focuses more on understanding uh, chord structures, chord progressions, and just being able to uh, improvise things a lot more. So I, I was taught more, much more classically, and I find the jazz side more interesting, but still at this point, I am pretty unskilled in that side of things. Maybe also a, a bit more difficult, because in, in classical music, you can just learn something by hard work and just apply it. And in jazz, you need to learn skills that have you working in real time, generating stuff, because improvisation is basically this. And classical musicians are not taught to improvise. They just taught to, you know, reproduce what is written and given by a conductor or someone. All right, how did you go further? Like, how did you get into audio DSP programming? So, hopping back a couple of minutes. Uh, so I, I got into school, I bought this keyboard, hooked it into the computer, and I was like, okay, so what applications are there? And I looked throughout Linux Audio and th think about the state of Linux Audio in 2008 or so. It, there, uh, it, it was pretty active, but it was also quite rough. I guess there was Alma Mass, which was doing the best things, and Ardor, but Ardor was hard. I couldn't use Ardor right off the bat. I was like, oh, how do I do anything here? <laughs> Yeah, and at the time, a lot of the applications, they they would be very brittle. So you'd hook them up to Jack. It would be X running constantly. Some of them just wouldn't compile. And at that point, Zinn was like on the like threshold of just not being able to compile anymore. So it barely compiled. <laughs> yep. Just enough so, to compile. <laughs> I had that compiled, and I think for a short time, I also had a package that I made for it on Slacks. And one of the things that I did, just I got sick and tired of seeing a million compiler warnings and whatnot. So I made a couple of uh, patches. And, oh, man, I, I overdid like the documentation on each one of these patches, did it so ridiculously overly formal at the point, because I just wanted them to get accepted. <laughs> I want and to be so precise what I did, so you know I know what I'm doing, so you will accept it, right? Well, yes, because basically I looked at the mailing list, I looked at the uh, code uh, activity and whatnot, and I was like, nothing's really going on here, so I, I have to be very precise to minimize the maintainer's amount of time so that they'll just get it in. Oh, so they don't and have to put back and forth asking, what is this? What is it doing? Why did you do this? <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> well, at that time, if I was doing that, then mostly I was just going to Google Translate and trying to translate some of the Romanian comments. Oh. <laughs> Most of those have been translated since, but at, at the <laughs> time, th there was a fair bit of Romanian in the code base. In the so, code base. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, I, I just submitted them. Uh, I think it was like three or four patches. They were uh, merged in, and then I was given like commit access because I guess they were just good ultimate enough. power. <laughs> <laughs> now I can make Zen always do farts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on startup or whatever, <laughs> and nobody's gonna ask. <laughs> oh boy! So th that that was fun getting into, and at that point, my C C plus plus skills. They, they were embarrassingly bad. So I, I think it was like maybe a year before that. Uh, so I was trying to learn C, and I had some background at that point in doing Java. And for some reason, I thought it was a good idea to write a small string processing library to try to understand things. But I had misunderstood some of the C uh, documentation. So, you are, how familiar are you with ASCII? Not very. I know A is 63, and that's it. So, do you, do you know what zero is? I don't know. So, the way that C strings work is you have a bunch of letters, and then you end the string by having a zero. So, it, a character of value zero. 
Oh, it's a null string character. Yes. And when I had read the documentation on it, for some reason, I thought instead of using a null, you were supposed to use this one character that had a short name, EOF. And that stands for end of file. <laughs> so I had built a string library at the time that was working on strings that all the strings ended with the end of file symbol. So it terminated all streams, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> it it, it was absolutely terrible. I think that was the first time I went on IRC and they correctly told me, go read the manual. <laughs> and, and that's when I learned documentation is very good. Actually, I love documentation. It's like the most stuff I read nowadays is is manuals, is readthedocs.com. Uh, I'm just eating this up. Well, yeah, you, that's why most of the stuff that I end up reading nowadays is like research papers, but trying to get back to more standard literature. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm mostly but, reading like, you know, forum posts and articles about stuff that I want to learn and <laughs> some papers too, but I don't understand most of the papers. I just curious, interesting. The, the, the problem if you get into any sort of academic stuff is you need so much context to understand why the author is talking about any of the stuff they're talking about. Yeah, I can understand the the first part. And then when they go into the meat, I just go, Whoa, OK, <laughs> bye. <laughs> uh, but hopping back, basically, I submitted a bunch of pieces of code, got uh, developer access to Zinn and decided to try to push out a release. And that, I think, was the first of the 2.4 series. And I think that happened early 2009. And the last release before that was four years or five years prior to that. So I was seeing this as kind of trying to revive a dormant to somewhat dead project. Oh, interesting. So. It was kind of stalled for many years, and you, you were just you know picking it up, giving it some, yep. giving it some love. So yeah, I, that that's what my original plan was. wasn't sure how long I was going to stick around doing that. Apparently for a while, <laughs> and yeah, just pick it up again. And how did you actually got to take it over and become the main maintainer? Because well, you were, you were technically probably the only person that contributed code at the time. It was 2009, but it wasn't until, I don't know, some a few years after that then that you were like started being known as the maintainer of Zenit SubFX when like Paul Nasca handed it over to you. I don't know. So at, at that point, I think that there were roughly three people or so that were uh, contributing code from time to time. Uh, and majorly, there was uh, another individual right around the same time that I had started to pick it up. Uh, Harold Haval, I, I think is how you say his name. And he's uh, the person that's actually responsible for helping to translate over from the original make file system to the CMake build system. And also, he was the motivator for translating from, I forget if it was CVS or SVN, to Git. Because at that time, Git was a relatively new piece of technology. So he helped motivate a couple of the shifts there. And yeah, it, it was only a couple of people really doing the development. And there was that side of things. And then at around that same time, there was the whole Yoshim, uh, Yoshimi uh, debacle, but oh, that's that's a whole bag, a uh, can of worms or so. Maybe we should interview some people and do a, a video about this. <laughs> Maybe we can get the Yoshimi developer on, on board. Uh, I, I can't decide if that, that issue is worth poking at all <laughs> or not. It, it, it seems to be just kind of a time sink at this stage. But yeah, around that time, uh, that large fork happened. I was working on some relatively similar stuff to what they were working on. And that, I, I think it was like mid-2009 or so, that was the first attempt to rewrite the GUI. 
And was already the idea to make it single windowed? Uh, it was to translate it to QT. So move away from FLTK, be able to use some of the nicer things that QT had exposed to it. And it, it was just too big of a task at the time. Uh, n none of the developers there had like enough uh, background and just raw time to throw at it to get it working well enough. Yeah, they would have to put a lot of time to just learn Qt first and, and then do all the work, right? Yeah, and the biggest problem was just how ridiculously coupled the user interface and all of the signal processing was. Just every part of the GUI had access to every part of the back end part of the program, and it was just a mess, an absolute mess. And that, that first like push was really a big motivator for a lot of the changes that I did since trying to modernize everything, make it much easier to maintain, much easier to add features, so and so. And to decouple the synthesis engine and the GUI. Yep. And now it's, is it all done via OSC internally right now? Yep. So you can, in, in theory, you can write your own interfaces to Zenith SubFX. You can write a console command line interface if you want, if you can talk OSC, right? Well, I actually have one of those that I use mostly for debugging. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, OSC prompt. So I one of the nice things about the current way things are set up is... The uh, back end for Zen should work even if you have multiple different user interfaces connected simultaneously. I'm not saying that it works in practice, but in theory it should work. And that's one of the ways that I am able to just hook up this debugging uh, tool. Uh, and even if it's like mid uh, run through, got a piece that I've been playing around with for a while, I can just hook up this uh, debugger, send messages to it, and then see what the user interface is actually looking at without needing to restart or attach like GDB or any of that. Kind of like attaching to a TMUX session right in the middle. Yep. That's cool. Actually, I was, I recently reported a bug with, with this, I guess, because I had uh, a few instances of Zenat sub effects in order and one was had some automation and <laughs> the automation bled through to another instance on a different track and my faders were moving. It didn't affect the sound, but it, it did affect the GUI. And if I clicked on the knob while it was, it was moving, the GUI would pick up this value and send it over to the engine and it would actually alter my, uh, <laughs> my sound then. So it was <laughs> very strange. I guess it's still on like this. I, I, I don't know if, if, if it was fixed already. Uh, I <clears throat> believe, well, it's, probabilistically fixed before you basically the way that it chose the osc port was very deterministic which i did originally so that i could debug things a bit more easily so you have a I've fixed now... port number <laughs> and you can just dial up that number and you know there's going to be some sub effects there well what it does is uh, previously it said okay we'll try to open this port number if it's not occupied then we'll take it and what it was doing is it was taking a port number that a previous uh, user interface had. So the old uh, backend was still sending messages to that port and something new just showed up there. So it started getting those messages. So the engine was like, oh, they stopped listening. Oh, they're listening again. <laughs> but it was yes. someone else listening now <laughs> and they didn't realize. So I, I basically changed it so it's a randomized port at the moment. So. If you do it enough times, eventually you'll see that again. But I'm assuming that you're not doing this thousands of times trying to get this sort of bad behavior. No, I usually have, like, I usually start with eight tracks with Zenet sub effects for new composition. Then I probably go higher if I run out of them, but not thousands. <laughs> <laughs> However, I got a collision. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a one-time thing or I don't know. Yeah, the, the original bug, like, you, you could do it every time, guaranteed. <laughs> the new one, it, it takes effort. <laughs> Maybe there should be a hidden way to randomize the OSC port if you have a collision. So you can just, you know, tune into another channel, like in a handheld radio or something. <laughs> like a wireless well, mic. 
right now the solution is just called close and open again and then hope that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't great, but eh, it, it should work well enough for the short term. Well, that's that's a solution for many problems in IT general. <laughs> in life, yep. not so much, but in IT. All right, maybe I'll ask you the, the big question that I guess a lot of people are waiting for. Uh, is uh, Do you know when Zenfusion will be fully open sourced? So, prob most likely by the end of tomorrow. Wow. So... The 2018 will gun is going to start with Zenfusion open source. That's going to be huge. Yep. The only thing that I have to make sure is that stuff is going to be able to compile with all the build scripts. It's basically, I've just developed everything in a bunch of Git repositories that I've just been hosting on my web server. And it's just a matter of changing those URLs over to GitHub. To push them public. Yep. Wow. And what, what are your... Plans. What do you what you're going to do next with Zenit SubFX once this is done? <clears throat> so the major things are just fixing all the remaining bugs, polishing things up as need be, and once that's relatively stable, the big plans for 3.1.x is going to be shifting the parameter representation internally. Uh, so. That's a bit of a mouthful to say, but essentially when Zin was originally built, most of the parameters were 0 to 127. And this was to keep things compact in terms of memory, compact in terms of how much computation needs to be done on various things. But it is pretty limiting, especially once you get into the domain of being able to do automations. Yeah, that's, that's a big problem I run into, especially if you automate filters or... Um, FM gain. Well, I believe the filters. I've already transitioned them over. Yeah, I, th I think the filters are, are are much smoother. But but still, automating the amount of frequency modulation is producing some steps, and you can hear it. Yeah. So the the goal is essentially to translate all of them over, and when translating them, they both get more dynamic uh, sort of range, as well as having some sort of meaningful unit. So for some of them, that's just going to be like percentage. So percentage of modulation, but for frequency, instead of having, oh, it's a 67 per, uh, frequency, you'd be able to say, well, without any sort of additional modulation, that's at, I don't know, 1.2 kilohertz. And just being able to know that and have an intuitive feel for it is nice. Oh, yeah. I think that's, that's going to help, especially new users to better to get a better feel for, for the interface because, yeah, most of the parameters, I think actually almost all are right now just random arbitrary numbers from 0 to 127 or 0 to, yeah. And ugh, what is this frequency one? It kind of forces you to listen to what you're doing. And this is something I heard that the um, developers of Massive at Native Instruments had in mind, that, that there are no numbers displayed on the Massive interface, so you have to listen. And it's like more analog style, the hardware thing, when you have the knobs and you have a scale, but it's not an, it, it doesn't have to be precise. You, you, you're not sure, you have to listen. However, it's way easier if you can see the numbers, because you can do something by memory. You don't have to listen every time, and if you just want to dial in something you know, you can do it very quickly. And here we are memorizing, okay, I set the filter to 32. What is 32? Well, maybe 42, the answer to universe, life, meaning of everything. <laughs> Especially for yeah. frequencies in LFO. Do you think that would also enable us to have LFO synced with the BPM of a song and have it like in quarter notes or something? BPM is a very highly requested uh, feature, and that is one of the things that would be nice to have integration uh, with uh, Zen. And it's also something that kind of goes along with having some sort of meaningful parameter representation. Because then you can probably toggle, let's say, your LFO frequency knob, and first it starts in hertz, and then you, I can like do something to it, and then suddenly it's in, oh, well, how is it in relation to the BPM? Is it going to be a 1-1, one, one, a 1-2, yada, yada? So 
it would be nice to have that sort of level of additional functionality. And that's one of the things that I would like to integrate in the future. Yeah, this is something I think Helm is doing pretty nicely. Because you, you can sync it and you, you can set the LFO speeds in very different ways. You can set it in millisecond cycles, you can set it in hertz, I guess, and the beats and so on. It's uh, yeah, it's nice and it's easier to understand what you're doing and what to expect from the sound. Yeah, Helm does a very good job at that in, in terms of presenting uh, what sort of parameters you're working with, providing users with an intuitive way of kind of interacting with them. And that's historically been one of uh, Zoom's biggest issues. It just isn't necessarily that intuitive until you get the feel, oh, I want to change this thing. Oh, it's this knob over there, rather than being able to reason about it. Yeah, being able to easily discover it as you do it. <laughs> So, uh, actually, there's a question from a, from someone on Facebook. Uh, why the hell it's so difficult to use? Gian Paolo, Gian Paolo Di Nino asked. Why the hell it's so difficult to use? I guess, well, that <laughs> kind of answers this, because we have random arbitrary numbers and no units, and also the names of the parameters are sometimes very cryptic, and they not, not well, all of them have meaningful uh, tooltips. That was one of the first patches that I actually uh, integrated when I was working on Zen, re-enabling the tooltips. Because when I first got to Zen, the tooltips were there, but they just wouldn't display. So they were disabled at a higher level, like, no tooltips. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Is it, I'm sure you're aware, those tooltips are very, very useful trying to figure out what the FLTK like user interface was doing. Yeah. It, so, I mean, I think the biggest reason why it's difficult to use, at least historically, is it's difficult to navigate between two things that are conceptually close. And that's one of the things about the new user interface design, which I think is uh, going to make things a lot easier for people in the future. You mean like navigating between a global filter in AdSynth and a voice filter? Because we have basically the same controls, almost the same, but they are at the different level in the signal chain. And Yeah, so with the new user interface, that's one click. With the old user interface, that's going to be one click and then five minutes of sorting the 50 windows to figure out where it went. And if you're using three instances at once, which I do frequently, then it's just a mess. Yep. And you spend a lot of time alt-tabbing and hiding windows and unhiding them to find the one you, you really are, <laughs> are using and need. And then you just have to really hope that your desktop man or windowing environment doesn't have one of those roll-up features. Because as soon as you roll up one of those old windows, you're not going to figure out that you did it. And just have this title bar floating somewhere. And what, what was that one? Was it this? Was this? Is this the one that I really need? And I'm just looking around all the other ones. Many times I had like the situation where I do something and I turn a parameter and I set some things, turn some knobs, and I'm like, I'm not hearing really any auditor feedback. And then I realize it, it was the wrong instance. And I, I, I changed the patch of an instrument that wasn't even playing. And then I, oh, shit. <laughs> what did I do? Okay, I wanted to set the lead. I, I, I changed the bass sound. What's going to do? Oh, man. So I, I hope, like, the, the new interface, it's interesting because um, it's like, I don't know if you ever used Blender, the open source free package. Oh, I love Blender. Me too. I use it every day at work because I do graphic design for product visualizations and I love it. But I had a big reserve to switch between Blender 2.49 and Blender 2.5 because it was a complete GUI rewrite and everything was different. And I had the same trouble going from Zenet SubFX 2.x to Zenet SubFX 3.0, basically Zen Fusion. Because I I was like, just, oh, it's, it's completely different. Like, I wouldn't be productive for the first time when I use it. I, I would have to, like, you know, a few weeks to just do it and learn it, and I would be less productive during that time. And I was like, I have to work, do work. I have tracks to finish. I just, uh, I can't switch over right now. But then I said, no, you have to do it. Switch over. 
and I even announced it publicly, so I have no way going back in case I get lazy. So I have to learn Zenfusion, and you probably saw that I just started, you know, putting more issues on GitHub as I went because I discovered more problems, and and it's interesting. I I wasn't very sure it's going to be much faster to work with, even though you have one window. But once I did it, I realized it is. And I was pretty fast with the old one, because I learned my way, I could just, you know, click by memory almost. Unless the windows came <laughs> crashing down on my face, saying, I don't know what, what what is it anymore, what I'm looking for, but... But now I'm figuring out I can do it even faster with the new interface, which is awesome, I didn't expect that. I expected it to be more compact and easier to navigate and manage on your win on your screen, but not necessarily to be to be faster to navigate and do things, but but it is, and that's really great because it's helping the productivity, and that's very important. And also, everyone who just takes a look and says, "Whoa, that's awesome! How can I get this?" And this is also important because the instrument is inspiring to people. They take a look at it and they, "Wow, I want to do something with this," and and then they do. Yeah, I think for Zinfusion, this was the probably fourth time that I had seen someone propose a uh, GUI redesign. And this was the first one that actually seemed to kind of make sense of the whole program. Most other ones out there, they just started lopping off parameters left and right and trying to shove everything into the smallest space possible. And it just, it seemed worse than what was already there. Yeah. I guess there is still some work to be done with rearranging the parameters. Sometimes um, there are some weird arrangements in Zinfusion interface. Sometimes you have like some knobs are very small and some are very big and there are some spaces unused or something. But this is, you know, just balancing. It's already functional. You can do work with it. There are some parameters that are not exposed, but it's not a killer and you can get around. Yeah, I, I think you've found maybe four or so parameters that have been cut off. But... Yeah. The vast, vast, vast majority of the, oh, it's like 8 million possible parameters are accessible. <laughs> yeah. And I really like that you have mm, you have visual feedback for like EQ uh, shapes and for filter uh, response curves. You ha didn't have this before and you can immediately see which filter you're using if you don't, if you, even if you don't know what, what the name of it is. And also the distortion functions are visible and updating live, which is great because I never knew what some of these functions were doing. I was kind of guessing. And I figured out that like quant is probably just doing bit reduction. Yep, quantization. Yeah, but uh, it took me quite a while to really figure this out and now I can just see it and it's way faster to learn. There are some weird things with the um, frequency charts being a bit squeezed, I think, for the EQ. Like, I feel there is too much room in the low end, and, like, I'm, like, the graph is like that, and right here is 100 hertz, and one right there is, like, 50, and, like, I have still so much room, and I don't need it, and I just feel weird. But that's, you know... That I think I might have Minor changed issues. that for the filters, but I think I could have forgotten to change it for the EQ at the same time. So they might have slightly different scalings at the moment. I should file a bug. <laughs> file an issue. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of tuning to be done there, and that the whole visualization side of things is probably my favorite part of uh, Zenfusion. The least favorite part is probably trying to figure out those stupid layout things, because... Oh, you you don't you have no idea how many hours I sat down trying to mathematically figure out what's the optimum way to place all of these different widgets. Oh man. I Well think you you've got all these things, they've got these different aspect ratios, and then you have the text boxes that are beneath them. And you never want to change the size of the text, but you don't want the text to overlap with the other text. You want to have a certain amount of padding, and you don't want to change any of the aspect ratios of any of those widgets. And oh I, I it was a very complex uh, solution that I had at the beginning. I think mathematically it was a better solution than what I have uh, currently in Zenfusion, but it also took way too long to uh, figure out what the optimal positions were. <sighs> that, 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 that was a big, large piece of work that has now just been rewritten into something very simple. <laughs> yeah, it's like you have to do it first the hard way to learn that 
that there's a there's a different way, but but you wouldn't find a better way if you didn't do it the hard way first. It's like you know, <laughs> it's and the thing is like the old interface for Zenit Sub FX, it's all static. There are pixel values that are just set, and you don't touch it. The the window has a fixed size every window, which is there are a lot of them. But with this new, with Zenfusion, it's all dynamic. You can scale it, you can change the aspect ratio of the window, and it all aligns. And it has to make sense with this. It, so this is more like designing a website than laying out buttons on a, on a window, I guess. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that I think has bugged the designer considerably, because the designer comes up with all these images, and it's just like, oh, this thing goes exactly at that pixel location. And I can't say, like, yeah, I know it's different, but I can't just place it at that pixel location and just expect it to work. Story, right? Because as soon as you resize it, what is it doing? It, it wouldn't make sense. Actually, it was funny. I, I I don't know. I guess you fixed this, but I remember you could make Zen Fusion just like you know fifty by one hundred pixels, and it was all so small it was hardly visible. But it, but it worked. <laughs> oh, it's 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 excellent that it's resizable because when I ended up uh, getting my newest laptop. I ended up going with one of the high resolution screens and most applications, the text is just way too small, but with Zenfusion since everything just scales, it's fine. You just hit maximize window and then everything is like a perfectly good size again. And you have more pixels used to, to show this stuff. I was thinking yeah. maybe about uh, maybe it would be nice to have uh, some spectral analysis built into Zenit Sub FX. Someone recently pointed out to me, I don't know if in a, in a comment on YouTube, some I guess, that uh, there could be a like a spectrograph. Uh, there's a synthesizer by ImageLine, the guys who made Fruity Loops or FL Studio, called Harmor, and it has a built-in spectrograph that you open up on a side and it shows you the the output of the raw oscillators. It's a it's a it's an additive synth, so it doesn't technically have oscillators, but because it's all about sculpting the harmonics and it's it's kinda helping. I don't know if it's a good idea to for Zenit sub effects. Well, th that kind of links into one of the ideas that I really wanted to get out but just had to be cut due to just time constraints. Uh so there's one system that's currently in the code base, which I've internally referred to as watch points. And what it allows for you to do is watch the internal state of the synthesis engine and be able to see some of those live values come out. And you can see that whenever you're in an LFO or an envelope, you'll see this uh, greenish line go from one side to the other. And sometimes the marker will correctly follow the line of the LFO. Usually not. There's some scaling issues there that I got to fix. But uh, what you're actually seeing is the raw values that are being output by the envelopes. Oh. And I've, uh, I've made it so that it can uh, send out a single value or it can send out a packet of values. And the original idea was to be able to have watch points that you would be able to set so that you want to see, well, what does this oscillator actually look like? And then you'd just be able to see it. Like plug in an oscilloscope or a spectrogram. Yes, it, and just, what is it doing here? Okay, what's doing there? Like pulling out probes to an oscilloscope and putting them on a, on a circuit board, <laughs> on a hardware synthesizer. Yeah, and I, ideally you'd be able to get something that uh, looks somewhat similar to, I think it's Renoise's top bar, where you can see a collection of different oscillators, be able to see their waveforms in essentially real time. Perhaps they also have a spectrogram version of that. But yeah, that that's something that technically uh, there is the resources already built into Zen. It's just a matter of plugging all of that into the user interface properly. So it's funny. There's functionality right there in the engine that it's not just rooted out to the to the GUI. Yeah, I just I did I ran out of time to code the GUI part, but I got the other part coded. <laughs> all right, so I guess maybe Zen Fusion three point one. I don't know three point two. It's funny, you yeah, you're, so think, it, you're thinking about making like different ways of interpreting that signal so you can like switch between an oscilloscope, uh, 
a spectral and art real-time spectrum analysis or maybe a spectrograph so you have not just uh, a sample of, of frequency response in, in a single point of time but you also have the history yeah so that, that is one of the things that eventually is going to be integrated uh, and other things for instance consider uh, the distortion view uh, one of the questions you're probably going to run into when you're using distortion is, okay, we've got this nonlinear function, but how much of that function is actually being used by the signal that's going into it? So how hot is the signal? Yeah, it's like on the calf compressor, you have this little dot on the graph that shows you where your input signal level is on the actual com compression function. It would be interesting. So I, seeing... Ideally, like the distortion graph would also be able to show, okay, you've got this signal coming in, and then this is the distribution that the signal roughly has coming into this function. So be awesome. you'd be able to see what that's doing. And then ideally, if you have some layer before it where you're able to inject a little bit of a DC signal or something to offset it, then Make you should be asymmetric. able to see the entire distribution shift. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like this. Oh, I like this idea. Also, I thought... Well, you could have kind of a, not PFL, like in the mixers, when you can just listen to a single track, but when you can yeah, have these uh, watch points, you could also listen to the sound coming there. Because, well, like temporarily switch be between the master output from the NetSubFX to listening to the, to the watch point, so we can not only see what the oscillator is doing, but also hear it before the effects or before the filter. Especially if you have like you know many voices and they're modulating each other, and you you're not really sure. And to be able to listen to a voice that is modulating another voice that is modulating another voice, uh, you have to you know disable some voices, change the velocities uh, to be able to actually hear it. With watch points, you could just click listen, right, and and listen to what is actually modulating your signal. And that could be very helpful in understanding the very complex frequency modulated patches or something. Now, that is something that way down the road might be a possibility, but involves a lot of extra technical architecture. Because one of the things you mentioned is you have to change all the volume levels around. And if you're just clicking, oh, I want to listen to this thing, then you get into the problem of, OK, are you outputting it at the same level? Are you trying to do some gain correction? How, how are you doing that? And there's a lot of extra technical things involved with that process. Visualizing, it's easy. You just get all the samples back, and you just say, OK, the smallest sample is now minus 1. The biggest sample is now plus 1. Interesting. And it's easy to just quick normalize. I thought it's, it's going to be as simple as, you know, master output is if monitoring, then Instead of master output, we we take the audio from the from the current uh, watch point output, right? What what is going to the analysis analysis module, and then we just put samples from there to the master output instead of what it should be coming out from the master output. But then it could maybe <laughs> you probably should have this muted first because you can you can create some weird signals if you're tuning the patches and you listen to the master output. You might have some wild volumes or stuff in between uh, that, that could not be sane to listen to on its own. Yeah, and then a lot of the internal signals that are routed through Zen, they're not all normalized in sane ways. I've tried to decipher some of it, but yeah, exposing that directly to the audio output, there would be a lot of renormalization that would probably be going on. <laughs> Interesting. Funny, this is stuff that I had no idea is actually happening under the hood, and I guess Nobody who isn't like you, knowing the code and have dug it up all from the ground up. Uh, we have no idea that this stuff is happening and there's, are, there are difficulties involved with doing something like that. Yeah, the, the thing when generally when you're doing any sort of big signal processing or machine learning system, you get something that works and then you add something to it and then you add something to it, then you add something to it, then you tune something that's in the middle of it and then you add something to it. And eventually, you don't know really what's going to be precisely happening at any of those middle steps without just rebuilding the entire new program that you've built up to that point. So some of that stuff was documented. A lot of it wasn't uh, because that's just kind of how these things naturally grow. Yeah. Some say software is grown, not built. You don't have a strict plan. 
well, you, you might have 1.0, right? <laughs> <laughs> but not everyone, I guess. It's like you're writing software and you have new ideas and you're shifting directions and it's growing. It's not, it's not just built. It's, it's a living thing. Well, it, it's quite interesting with Zinn if you want to ask that question because if you look at very old versions of the user interface, so I'm talking like maybe 2003, 2005 or so, you, you can see why some of those knobs were really cramped. So you, you, you can start to see, oh, this thing used to be one button and then they just added another button and they decided, oh, well, there's room for one more button. And that's how it kind of just grew. Oh yeah, we need another option, but we have just eight by eight pixels. All right, let's make it small. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it I looks a lot of like that. The randomization for LFOs were just crammed into the corner. <laughs> yeah, because there was no room and they didn't want to change the size of the window because they would have to reposition all the other elements of the UI. Of the UI. Oh, that, that is one of the things that I love about the framework that I have. I'm not specifying any of those locations, so if I just add another control to the box, it all just resizes itself. Not always correctly, but I don't have to specify all that stuff manually. So it's the Zest library, right? Yep. And you're going to be releasing this probably tomorrow so other people can use this and build their own interfaces, multi-platform for something. Maybe yep. audio plugins like, you know, LV2 stuff. I well, it's it's particularly well suited for stuff like audio plugins because it embeds pretty well. And uh, it uses a embeddable version of Ruby. Uh, to actually run the user interface to do all the drawing code and whatnot. And one of the nice things about embedding a VM, it, it does take some extra resources, but if you want to say, oh, let's have some global variables, well, they're global to that virtual machine. So you don't have global variables colliding from two different plugins. Interesting. I had no idea there is a virtual machine running Ruby inside Zinfusion. Oh, yes. Uh, well, basically, I started uh, working on Zenfusion by look, uh, working with Qt with their QML uh, sort of sub-library. And it was essentially a concise way of describing all these widgets and whatnot. And basically, with a user interface this big, you want to have a lot of concise descriptions of things. Otherwise, you're going to spend your entire day just typing out declar uh, declarations. And eventually, I got to the point where it was just like the existing infrastructure that Qt had was not going to work. It would get, have embedding problems, and it was much slower to implement stuff there than I was originally expecting. So I, I just rewrote all the interpreting stuff for QML, and instead of Qt loading it, my framework loaded it. So under the hood, it is using QML, the Qt standard for description of the interface, but it, but yep. you have your own Zest library interpreting that and drawing it, right? Yep, and the only other difference is uh, Qt's QML uses JavaScript to uh, define all sorts of short callbacks and whatnot. And that sounds tacky. <laughs> that doesn't sound it, good. It, it works <laughs> relatively well, but... I, I really do not like JavaScript. <laughs> and, and so instead of trying to keep it JavaScript, all those callbacks are now Ruby inside of the QML files that are written for Zest. All right. So instead of having a JavaScript VM, you have a Ruby VM, right? Yep. And uh, it works uh, pretty well. The compilation process is a bit hacky at this point, but it works. And I've got it down to <clears throat> one master build script that generates out uh, your demo version and full version uh, releases for Zinfusion. So it'll go through, fetch all the dependencies. It will compile everything and then produce out the tarballs or zips if it's uh, being built for Windows. So you have one command build on any machine, right? You just dump your source, one command, it's going to pull the, the dependencies, build it, prepare packages for releases, and bam, right? With, with a couple of minor exceptions, of course. Yeah. Uh, for, for instance, in order to uh, build on 
Windows, it, it assumes that you have access to basically apt-git and one of those repositories is going to give you uh, a usable Ming GW version. Interesting. And yeah, on Windows, it literally builds all the dependencies and statically links them because otherwise you're in the whole mess of just throwing in a pile of DLLs. Yeah, that's that's why the, the, the Windows releases of open source software that was conceived on Linux are often huge compared to the Linux ones because they have to bundle all these libraries statically linked, right? Yeah, and it is very large at the moment. I think I could probably shave off half the size of it Maybe I, I I don't think it runs the strip command. So I think that there's a lot of symbols that are left in those final binaries that really don't need to be there. But I haven't tested that yet. For GNOME debugger or something? Uh yeah, uh, the symbols are useful for like debuggers and whatnot. But I I can't figure out how to debug things nicely on Windows. <laughs> I can't debug there are ways stuff to do it, nicely not anywhere. Nicely. By the way, that uh, what is about uh, the OSX version? So when I was developing things, uh, basically I was maintaining a separate mailing list for people that were interested in hearing about status updates. And I got to the point where it was ready to have some basic testing done on all platforms. I got a decent amount of responses on Linux. I got some responses on Windows. That allowed for me to track down a couple of the major, like, it doesn't work, like, remotely at all on my system sort of uh, glitches. And when I sent out that sort of stuff for OS X, I had the user interface built. I had it running on OS X, and I got zero responses. So I basically was in the situation where I had, like, rented some time on a physical Mac computer because... Uh, Apple is weird about licensing, and I was essentially using a remote desktop to a remote computer, trying it out, and I, I was able to see that it booted, but I didn't know if I moved it to another machine if it would do anything at all, and I didn't know if the frame rate was abysmal because it's on remote desktop. You're, you're seeing a slideshow. You don't know if it, the GUI is actually a slideshow. Am I drawing 16 colors, or is it just the transmission? <laughs> Yeah, I, I never oh, got man. any responses back. So I, I basically said, okay, well, if I have a low level of interest, no one's willing to help me debug this, then I'm just going to say it's low priority and move on. All right. So Mac people, if you want Zen, Zen Fusion running on Mac, contact Mark and help him fix the problems or let him know if there are any problems. <laughs> because otherwise, he's not going to be able to do it. And I'm pretty sure Zen at SubFX on Mac would be a great deal because a lot of creative people use Macs and well that's that's a great piece of software and you have Ardor running on Mac so you could have Ardor and Zenith SubFX and you you have a pretty powerful duo for synthesizing sounds and mixing that I was I was using a Mac at work for three months before I realized the guy is a fraud and and he stole my money and he never paid me uh, but yeah, I, I couldn't use uh, Zenith SubFX, so I used Tall Noisemaker, I used um, Helm, and I learned some other synths uh, that I weren't using because I had Zenith SubFX, but now I don't have Zenith SubFX, so I had to use other stuff to do my job well, done, to get my job there done. Is a, there are versions of Zen that go on OS X. Uh, I believe the most recent one... Uh, Maybe that was like 2.5.4 or something like that, and it was jack only. Oh. So it not ideal in terms of what it was outputting. And uh, one of the other issues with getting stuff moved to OS X is I am not very familiar with the packaging of stuff on OS X. There are a couple of people in Linux Audio that seem interested in helping out with that side of things. But essentially, you have to package things up and then make sure they get installed to the right paths. And since I don't have a physical Mac to check if I've done anything correctly, I've always been hesitant to put a package out there and just be like, yeah, it doesn't doesn't work even like remotely. <laughs> yeah, that would be a weird way of releasing software. Well, have this. It's not going to work, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> well, maybe it's it, maybe it is a way to see if there is anybody on the Mac using it. <laughs> it's uh, like putting out something and popping up a window, dude. 
help out us, help us out debugging this software. We don't have a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just crashes because, well, maybe that's a way. I, I, I don't know. There are some Mac users. Uh, by and large, the largest chunk of users, though, is definitely on Windows, just because there's more people that are Windows users. And right and now I we have like. You have like native Z Z VST version of Zenfusion, right? So no more old packages or trying to, or just running it in standalone, right? Well, the VST for Windows, that actually happened quite a while ago. Uh, someone who goes by uh, Jakku on the KVR forums had built a Windows VST version of it. I had spoken to him a couple of times while he was like in the midst of developing that if he wanted to get commit access and just be able to work on the same exact code base so that everything can be shared and whatnot. He, he wasn't uh, particularly interested in that and seemed to have like some decent reasoning. He just didn't feel like breaking the Linux version than us breaking the Windows version and having that back and forth. So he just found it a bit simpler. A L little annoying because a lot of forks have popped up of Zen over the years, but uh, it, it seems to have worked out decently well. Yeah, but but it's vastly outdated. It was like two point two. I don't know. Um, I, oh, it I was know. forked off. I think two point four point three. Yeah, something like that. And then we had like you know two point five, and it was still lagging behind. So it was pretty old. But oh, I have oh there is a two point oh point oh VST version on uh, on uh, SourceForge from two thousand four. Yeah, and the problem is basically when I had started working on Zen, all that Windows code was just broken. Like there was there was no reasonable way to get it to compile. It was so, like so outdated in relation to how the system changed over the years. That's yep. like bit rot in in the terms of code. And yeah, when I first got to the project, bit rot was the major thing that I was trying to fix because not necessarily a lot of functionality had changed uh, to the rest of the code base, but compilers had moved forward and just a lot of the libraries had started shifting. So yeah, software needs some maintenance to keep it running. Yeah. Unless you want to have keep virtual machines of every system you, you ever used and have everything sandboxed, but they can't talk to each other. So it's a bit hard to be productive with that. And s some people, they they will do that. Probably for some retro uh, stuff like you know computers that machines that are not around anymore, like the eight bit and sixteen bit machines, Amigas and, and the Commodores. Yeah, well, don't, don't necessarily say that they aren't around anymore. You'll you'll find yeah. plenty of people using old technology. They're not made anymore, <laughs> right? They are around. <laughs> they have cult I status. Think about all the banks that are still using uh, COBOL. Oh my. It's terrible. It's like you you built it like 20 years ago or 30 years ago and it's still running and you you, you just you can't afford to 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 <laughs> move it over to a different system. Oh my. Or no, or just nobody knows how to fix this. It just, just it's so old. Well, it's eventually going to hit that point where there's only going to be a couple of programmers left and then just no one knows how to do anything with it and then you got to update. <laughs> And then <laughs> ancient programming languages, dead programming languages. Oh man, that's 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 the that's the bit rot. Ooh. I have. So, what question were we even on? I think we were for on, on plans for Zenit Sub FX future, and I also asked you uh, via email about uh, future funding model. Would you like to talk about this? So, uh, <clears throat> future funding models is, is a tough question, I guess. Uh, one, originally, with the Zenfusion process, I, I had internally set a couple of thresholds that it could possibly reach, which would indicate that I could uh, work on it full-time a bit more. But, I mean, it, it definitely did get some sales, but it wasn't enough that it could really sustain me yet for full-time work once, like, I have to pay all for my own health insurance, I have to uh, find another place to live, cost of living, all that sort of stuff. So in terms of funding models, it's probably going to be 
bit more on the tip jarry sort of side of things again in the future. Uh, the plan is probably to keep uh, releases up on uh, Gumroad and to decrease the price of that. And probably both the Windows and OS X users will try to find binaries through there. And then presumably everyone on Linux is going to have a package pretty soon after the user interface is open sourced. I'm going to let Falk TX know if he's not listening to package it for KX Studio. He, he, he's aware it's coming out. So uh, as long as I fix the paths that the build scripts need, presumably he's going to have it built very, very, very soon. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm going to still use uh, Gumroad for that. There's still going to, of course, be the standard donations on PayPal, which it's 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 got a couple of bucks here and there, usually not too much per year. And then one of the nice things about everything being open sourced is it's also in theory going to be possible to get into nightly builds for stuff like uh, Linux packages, Windows packages, etc. So that way, if something changes, someone's able to quickly just test out well, what, what is the current version actually doing compared to the older version? Yeah, but you need you need a build server for this, or I don't know, maybe some Linux company or a university would let you use a virtual machine or something to, to, to set up a build server for that. I don't know. Well, there, there's one service that's linked up with GitHub. They call themselves Travis CI, and... So it provides continuous integration, so continuous builds uh, for a project, and it is free if everything's open source. So I know LMMS is using that. Huh? I know LMMS is using that. Or yeah, they I think were. They're using that for their app builds, app package. It's something for an all in one sort of like binary. That app image? For. App image, that's it. It's in the world of <laughs> loopback device mounted s programs with their own file system, <laughs> like Snappy and what's the other thing? Uh, Flatpak. Th there's a couple in that area. <laughs> but yeah, so the plan is to, I don't know, try, try to continue to get a little bit of funding here and there and... Just accept donations as they come, I guess. The the income that's come from actually using Gumroad is basically makes prior donations disappear or look like a blip in terms of if you plotted the graph of cash over time. <laughs> yeah. But still, everything's appreciated. Uh, I've heard from some people and I myself i i think that well the this release of zenfusion is pretty costly on the gum road it's not not anybody can afford like you know almost 60 bucks but so probably uh yeah i know that a lot of people were waiting for the open source release to to just start using it because they just couldn't couldn't shell out so much money but probably they will be happy to just you know throw a a buck a month your way uh, were you thinking about using something like, you know, a recurring donations platform like, I don't know, maybe Patreon or LiberPay to keep that maybe, maybe make it more visible? Because I I myself forgot about the PayPal donations. They are on the page in the contribute section on the on the down, down there on the page. You can click donate and you get a little PayPal thingy, but it's not much advertised, so... Well, Maybe I if... think it used to be advertised a little bit more, but basically I thought it would be very tacky if it was possible to uh, purchase something and then see a donate button like on the same page. So I de-emphasized those a little bit during the main uh, Zenfusion fundraising uh, period. Yeah, maybe having both going on at the same time would be weird because, well, you sell stuff and you accept donations. Uh, what's going on, right? I think Helm has uh, something that it asks you to donate money after you download it. I yes yes uh, they've 
Are you saying within the app itself they've got? No, uh... it's on the web page. You go download ah. Helm, and you have a donation button, and you can just type in nothing, and it will remind you. I guess. I think it's nice. It's funny. I I donated five dollars just because I thought it's good. It's a good idea, and then I I read up that I'm eligible for a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote afterwards, hey, Matt, I <laughs> I sent you five bucks. Can you send me a sticker? And he sent me to advertise this. I think it's nice. I miss, I would love to have a Zen Sub FX sticker. I was thinking about designing one myself, but I'm not really, I don't know if I could, like, I don't know, print them out and sell them through mail. I don't know if I can handle this. Well, I mean, the icon that the designer had come up with is is kind of like a nice sticker size, and that's something that it's probably a lot more practical if you're giving it out at conferences or so. Because, for instance, if you're thinking about Helm with a five dollar uh, donation to obtain a sticker, I think within the U.S. to send international mail, it's like I don't know a dollar fifty or something like that. And then if the donation's through PayPal, then you got an extra 35 cents there with a couple more percent. So you get so then like your $2.5. turns into like 250 or something. Yeah. Well, that's always the thing. Like money transfer is costly. So like, you know, you think you get, you have $10 displayed on Patreon that you get. Actually, you get 650 or 7 like after the fees. I don't think it was that bad. It was that bad after their update, but I think they reverted that. I don't know. They, I think they didn't even roll it, uh, roll it out. They, they stopped it. They, they, they canceled that change because many people were complaining, and I had like you know, two patrons just just quit Patreon altogether, I guess. And so I, so I seen this, uh, this impact having an impact on, on the supporters because well, and they said that it would be uh, the better, the best, the worst thing for people who just pitch in one dollar because they would get have the most percentage of their donation <laughs> taken off, taken out, which is which sucks. So they reverted this, and they're not rolling out that change, and they apologized. But again, maybe liber pay could be an option. I was asked by one of these people uh, to to make a liber pay account so I can provide an alternative for people who don't want to use pay Patreon. I I yet have to look into that, probably in the 2018. Yeah, they're all interesting systems. Uh, I mean, when it came to figuring out the funding for Zinfusion, trying to figure out, well, what, what sort of pricing makes sense? What sort of model is a Kickstarter approach better? Is something like a Patreon a better solution? It, it was it was a tough call to figure it out and might have chosen some wrong things in practice, but it was mostly just trying to figure out well what what's going to net something in a reasonable period of time. And Patreon is a it, it's a it's a good model and I, I find it a very interesting project, but it's very much a slow burn sort yeah. of uh, build. You need to build up a snowball to be able to really sustain something from it. And it's yeah. Uh, and I, I think if anyone's really interested in this stuff, uh, the people over at snowdrift.coop or co-op, they ended up uh, making a couple of uh, articles basically on all these different funding platforms, their trade-offs, uh, how they pose issues for open source in particular. And it, it's, it's a pretty interesting set of documents that they've uh, compiled showing kind of the trade-offs that you're going to incur with each and every sort of model. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot of questions to be asked and answered if you want to fund anything. And if you're if you're a developer or an artist and not a salesman and you know not an entrepreneur um, necessarily, it's it's really hard to figure out what will work and what will not, what will piss people off, <laughs> and or what will encourage them to help you out. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a tough ride and. It's funny. I've I've had albums set up on Bandcamp for s actually for like you can download them for free apart from the from the newest one. But the sales only started rolling in after I started the Unfa Vlog video series, and like when I passed like ten tenth video, it's like every every once in a while someone buys an album. Sometimes two albums go sold in a week, 
And like it, it's really funny because the music was there, right? But nobody knew about it. So I, I also decided to just uh, let people know that I have an album and that they can buy to support me after every video. So it is advertised because I guess people just don't know. Because <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to figure out how to present things. Yeah, and, and what will not break your main content, because I don't want my content to be ads about me or anything else. I just want I want to teach people, mostly. But to be able to teach people, I need to find a way to justify it to my family <laughs> that I spend X hours every week or something talking to a camera and then editing this out instead of making money somewhere else. So it is to be able to do it. Seriously, I need to make money above it. So I'm trying to build up a snowball of Patreon and maybe Bandcamp sales to be able to take one week every one day every week to do this. That would be awesome. And I, I actually set up goals for this on Patreon. And there's an even goal like, whoa, making videos and music is my full time job now. Right? <laughs> I figured what would be able, what would allow me to do this? And of course, it's a high, it's a high, um, high goal, but. Maybe it's possible. I don't know. Let's try it. We'll see how big and how generous and wealthy the open source musician community is. Yeah, I know one of the major things that I had to consider when I was going into Zinfusion is essentially, since I was in grad school, by taking a summer to work on that, I was trading that off with doing an internship. And that's a trade off of well, what sort of income would that bring in? Well, what sort of experience would that gain me? What, how is this going to impact uh, things when I'm looking for jobs? Basically and your career, right? Yeah. <laughs> Are you building a career with developing Zenit SubFX or Zenfusion or doing some other stuff? Well, I, I looked at the stats and it was basically unrealistic to probably stay as a career for Zenfusion in any way, shape, or form, but... It, w it was something where there was a chance it might be viable to spend like another, I don't know, eight months or so working on Zinfusion if it seemed like there was a ton of interest. And that would have allowed me to get all of those polishing things done. It would have allowed for me to really thoroughly uh, clean out the bugs and uh, just add a lot of those extra features that had to be cut just due to time constraints. That's actually pretty insane, right? How much time did you put into making Zinfusion a thing? So if you ignore all the development uh, of the 2.5 major re-architecture, if you ignore all the developer hours spent after the release panicking like, holy cow, this thing is a buggy mess. What am I doing? <laughs> and uh, I'm selling it, right? <laughs> I, I think it was in the order of like seven or 800 hours. Oh, my. So about 700 hours, right? Yeah, in that ballpark. Well, that's that's like I I once did uh I did a few audiobooks. One was a big one and it took me like 160 hours to record everything, edit and and put out record music for it and everything. So that's like five of these audiobooks and that is a enormous amount of work. I think I have the statistics on how much of each language is used. Let me see if I can run that script. So let's see. Total lines of code in just a user interface. Uh, hold on. Uh, 28,850 lines. And in terms of... Uh, other stats, let's see. The main repository, 224 commits. The ones that were just the widgets, 579 commits. The stuff that was just used to ferry OSC messages from one side to the other. Ignoring all the stuff for uh, our, our, the real-time OSC library that I had already written, that 108 commits. Let me actually see how many were in real-time OSC lib. Uh, let's see. One line. That has roughly 228 commits. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's it's a big, big program for just the user interface. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge project for just one person to manage at all. Like, I can't imagine even, you know, 
even reviewing commits from other people for something like that. <laughs> I do you think that open sourcing it will help you like attract some people to help you out with the development and implementing fixes? Or I'm maybe hoping, in the future? But you, you don't really know if it's going to or not. Uh, it might end up drawing in a bunch of people that want to have a couple of small features. It might just be something where it's out there and it's just too different from other things and people are like, ah, that's too much work to figure it out. It It's hard. And uh, that's one of the things with like Zen that I've tried to uh, look at a number of times trying to go through academic literature. Well, what attracts newcomers to open source? How do you make it more attractive to them? How do you onboard a new developer and help them stay around and uh, go through the code base and stuff like that? And for a really niche community like Linux Audio, it's it's difficult. And that those sort of articles were one of the reasons why I ended up having that short blog series about kind of how I saw Linux Audio on the developer side of things declining somewhat. And it was kind of worrisome because unless you have a relatively decently large crowd of people that have pretty advanced technical skills, it's hard to keep all these different applications progressing. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And there's also, you know, probably it's not easier because we have a very complicated audio stack on Linux with different subsystems working together or against each other sometimes. And, you know, you, you, sometimes you have random situations where it just doesn't work and you have no idea why, even though you're using it for, for a decade. Like, I had this on Sonoy. I <laughs> I had a laptop on, on stage and then I just had X runs from Jack all, all the time. I didn't know why. I didn't have anything like that ever. I just had to reboot it. And it's on the video. I rebooted it on stage. <laughs> and yep. I played some music from my phone <laughs> to entertain people. Actually, the, the crowd, the people were amazing and they took it really well. And they were very supportive and positive. It 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 was really amazing to be there and experience the Linux audio community face to face and talk to people. I never went to these kinds of events related to what I care most about. I gone to some other events to just be like a an addition, like I, I gone to conferences for security nerds to you know make them learn something else and made music with LMMS live before them, but it wasn't my crowd, it wasn't my people, and and now this were my people and these are my people and it's exciting and maybe maybe it's it's good idea to uh, it's a good idea to make more videos like that and talk to people and like I think it might help build out the community and let it see and hear who we are and to better know each other and help us make better software and make better use of it. I think yeah, we're def starting definitely to Yeah, definitely seeing any sort of video about a piece of software or just discussing it helps a ton uh, because you, you see all those little things that you overlook because you do it one particular way and you don't realize that everyone else is doing it some way else. Because there was no tooltip <laughs> to tell you. <laughs> I have some. Uh, I have some other questions. If you, uh, if you want to say something else, I'll, I'll ask it afterwards. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I want to ask, what is your favorite piece of software apart from Zen and SubFX? It doesn't have to be audio related. It doesn't have to be uh, even open source. So when I first read this question, uh one game came to mind because whenever you're playing a game, that's kind of what just goes in the back of your head for a while. But then I realized I think the one that I'm valuing the most at the moment has to be the Julia project. And I think a lot of people have probably heard of MATLAB. And MATLAB is a, eh, a little bit of an older matrix processing language. You can do a lot of programming there and for stuff like machine learning and uh, any sort of signal processing, it's one of those standard tools that is just taught to most engineers. And one of the problems is it's closed source, it's slow, it's, it's, it's showing its age essentially. And Julia is a project that 
people at MIT started up a, only a couple of years back, I think. And it essentially does all those sort of matrix processing things much more quickly in a much cleaner way. And it's, it's one of those things that I am just constantly using uh, for my work. Like I think yesterday I must have had like four or five different uh, terminals with just this program open in it. I see that it, there's a source code and there are Linux packages, Windows packages, Mac OS packages, even ARM packages, so you can run it on a, on a tablet or something. It's good to know that there's an open source alternative to MATLAB that you say even does stuff better in some yeah, regards. If, if you're just looking for straight MATLAB, there's always Octave, and those people have done a fantastic job, but I'm... One of the drawbacks with stuff like Octave is that it is a lot slower than running stuff in C. Not necessarily the fault of any of the people that work on Octave itself. It's just the language doesn't lend itself that well to optimization. Hmm. Interesting. And then I'll, I'll mention the one game that originally had popped into my yeah. head when I first read it. What is it? <laughs> Factorio. Oh, and man. <laughs> That is a very fun and very addicting game. So that game is all about building a factory. So you're trying to build up layers of automation on top of layers of automation. And you end up getting all these like spaghetti logic situations where you have something that's just barely working. And it's, it's fun to play with. I was... I never played it, but I was uh, invited by friends, multiple friends, to play it on Steam with them. I, I declined it so far, but maybe I should give it a shot. <laughs> just make sure that you have enough time blocked out for it, because oh, yeah. if it's the thing that just clicks with your brain, the hours are going to slide by pretty fast. It's probably like Minecraft for some people. You just start digging and you wake up two hours later with tons of diamonds in your pockets. <laughs> and weird swords. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's very fun and it's, it's nice that it seems like there's a lot of games that are now having developers target Linux along the way. And this is one of those games? Yeah. Did yeah. they distribute for Linux too? Yeah, they've got Linux, OS X, uh, and Windows uh, versions. And it's nice when you don't really have to finagle with Wine or anything like that to get stuff working. Funny. The screenshots look a little bit like a merge between Transport Tycoon Deluxe and uh, Total Annihilation. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Interesting oh, blend. Uh, the, the era of like Transport Tycoon and like Roller Coaster Tycoon, like the original, all those nice isometric things, the, the art style definitely scratches those sort of itches. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been able to play those games. Yeah, I, I'm, I w I'm not playing games too much at all right now because most of the time I have free, I just either do win music or record videos. Many videos I record never get published because I messed something up or I decided that uh, it, it was crap and I have to rec record this and then editing and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not editing lots of videos because that is something that can be very time consuming. <laughs> yeah, it can. <laughs> I actually wrote a script for Caden Live to enable multi-threaded rendering because it uses Melt and you can generate a script. And then I made a script that took that script and created multiple scripts that would render chunks of the video and then concatenate. And I submitted it to GitHub and someone filed a request, like they just made a fix, a little fix, and it was like, wow, someone contributed to my software. I'm, I don't consider myself a programmer. I do some coding at work, but just it's very ugly bash code that just gets this stuff done. But I, I wouldn't consider myself a programmer. But it's... Well. Well, if, you, if you use Blender routinely, it does have a lot of Python that exposes, right? Yeah, I, I, I made a, a Python script for my work to get some... to get 3D models from, from Inkscape drawings with layers descripting heights and positions of different shapes, so we have stacks of extruded paths. And yeah, so that's... It's funny. <laughs> uh, I have more questions. Yes, um, questions. Like, um, reality aside, what is your biggest dream or wish in the 
in relation to Linux or open source music software? I, I guess the b biggest wish is to just see things continue on. Uh, if you look throughout, uh, let's say, a lot of the older wikis, you'll be like, oh, there's that piece of software, and you'll take a look. Oh, it hasn't been updated since 2003. That piece, that's interesting, and it's another dead link, dead link, dead link. There's, it doesn't there's build a lot anymore. of interesting things to dead end. So I'd like to see them uh, continued, and I'd like to see, like, things refined maybe merging some forces to do one project instead of five different ones doing the same thing over and over it's hard yeah, because i it... yeah uh, go ahead all right um it's hard because i think that a lot of developers go into open source and make these projects just to you know teach themselves sometimes do a just as an exercise and they just drop it and do other things but we might want to see that developed, but they're not interested in that because it was just just a practice, just an exercise for them. And it's hard to pick up someone else's code and, and just maintain it like you did. So it, I'm really glad you picked up Zen Sub Effects because, well, you know, I I value this piece of software a lot, and there's nothing like it, and it just enables me to do amazing stuff. And I really hope people will hear that you can do really top-notch sound design with open source software and make music and sound effects that really rock. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in this regard. And and I think Zenfusion is pushing this even forward because it will allow people to have a very modern and accessible interface to that. And it will help them learn the capabilities of the synthesizer that were just undiscovered under the obscure UI. Little people had the courage and the time to just dig in and figure out what these things mean. There were just tons of knobs and I had one video like an hour and a half or like I don't know 20 minutes when I just go through every knob in Zen Sub Effects interface and I want to do the same thing for Zen Fusion, but probably it's going to be shorter because there are blocks that are just, you know, um, like reusing the same parts. There is some reusing in the old Zen Sub Effects GUI, but Lots of that is just very random and <laughs> not well descript described. There's still work to do in Zenfusion in that regard, but well. Oh, there, there's tons of work left. Like if you look on the bug tracker, there's a number of issues that have like sub issues, sub issues, <laughs> lots of polishing that needs to be done. Yeah, I really hope and... some people can jump on and help polish this out uh, once once it's open source. So take some weight off your shoulders, not necessarily with, you know, pitching in money, but with just fixing bugs or helping to lay out the user interface better. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of projects just don't end up with the resources to, like, continue refining things. That's why a lot of, a lot of Linux apps, a lot of open source apps, they might under the hood have a lot of really cool stuff that works really well, but... For instance, they, they'll just have a user interface which is horrifically terse that you just can't parse. I, I think Blender, for instance, is one of the very few exceptions that since it's a graphics-focused app, they put all this time into the user interface. And it, it might be weird, but it seems like all the 3D modeling programs have weird user interfaces. Yeah, many people complain that Blender is weird. However, uh, I think it has its own way and... Once I learned it and I like used it every day and did, did stuff, I just wanted my whole system to work this way. I'm, I wanted a file manager that would look and work like Blender. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a window manager that would just be Blender with different programs and different tabs. Yeah, and uh, I, I think in the future, I will try to integrate some of the Blender-like ideas, if possible, towards like Zenfusion because it has its own language about things, and when you actually work with its language nicely, it just seems to flow. 